Good evening. It is the 20th of March, this 2021. And what are we looking at to start off with? Green loose states versus red tight states. Remember, I'm just reporting the data. I'm not here to interpret it. Well, maybe interpret it just a little bit. But here we go. What we're looking at it right here is green versus white. Green are your loose states, and those loose states are the ones which dropped a lot of the restrictions, for example, like these, loose state abbreviations, versus are tight, like those that want to maintain strict restrictions, strict restrictions. So here we are, and what we are looking at is new cases per 100,000 at a rolling seven-day average. Our data sources are going to be the CDC. And so we're going to go into rolling seven because they don't smooth the data. So we're going to smooth it for them. And look what we have here. Right there. That green line. At new cases per 100,000. Right off the bat. And the white line. Which is the states with tight restrictions. Cases per 100,000. Again, I'm trying to be non-biased and just report the information. Although quite enlightening at least in reference to pandemic mitigation strategies. Now let's get right into the research as follows. Bum, ba, da, ba. And, oh, by the way, this is more databases collapsing, just a heads up. For example, if you look at the last statement there, March 3rd, instead of us getting better with our data, we are basically restricting our data sources. But let's begin to proceed as follows. Here we are. Supplements may protect those with low vitamin D levels from severe COVID-19. Now, the takeaway from this is reading comprehension. Now, what we're looking at right here is patients with low vitamin D are more susceptible to severe COVID-19. All they are recommending is 1,000 units weekly, at least 1,000 units weekly. So you're looking at a very marginal amount of vitamin D on a daily basis. And they're just trying to plead with medical professionals to get at least these patients with at least a thousand units of vitamin D weekly. And I'm not saying a thousand units a day, a thousand units all for a total of seven days. And what's interesting finding in reference to this too, because we've covered vitamin D quite a bit, is the finding right here is that about 80% of COVID 19 patients have vitamin D deficiency. Now, obviously, this is a correlation and not a causative, but we saw before how with correlations reference to transmission rates and so on and so forth, and how basically vitamin D, at least at the very least, the endocrinologists here are trying to stress what's the difference. Just at least recommend vitamin D or prescribe vitamin D. Uh, they're going to end up being healthier regardless, even if it's not correlated with the benefit or is shown to be not causative with the benefit to reduction of severe COVID-19. So what do you have to lose except a person improving their health status? That's all they're trying to say is, hey, you don't have to have definitive uh, case to prescribe vitamin D to reduce COVID-19 transmission or deficiency. It's cheap. It's inexpensive, recommended, even if they doesn't impact COVID-19, they're going to be healthier for it overall. What's the holdup? And of course, you and I, be watching and covering this channel quite a bit, have failed to see many governments recommend vitamin D at all, even though it plays an incredible, incredible tantamount correlation in reference to the susceptibility of vitamin D across borders globally. All right, next one I want to go to is COVID-19 increases risk with airborne pollen. Now, this is really, really intriguing because what you're looking at right here is this. Is the team showed that airborne pollen can account for an average of 44% of the variation in infection rates, with humidity and air temperatures also playing a role in some cases. Remember how they went through humidity for quite a bit and temperature quite a bit? Pollen, 44% variation with infection rates on average 4% higher for every increase of 100 grains of airborne pollen per cubic meter. In some German cities, for example, where the study was conducted, concentrations up to 500 pollen grains per cubic meter per day were recorded during the study, which led to an overall increase in infection rates of more than 20%. Now, 
Now, after that, they go into basically conjecture into the hypothesis and how pollen tends to weaken the immune system in certain individuals, especially colds and coughs, so on and so forth. And it is just a real interesting impact because you may think, for example, a mask may be preventing the transmission of the virus itself, when ironically, what if it's just basically reducing pollen susceptibility? For example, let's say wearing a particular filtering mask when pollen concentrations are high can keep both the virus and pollen out of the airways. So that leads to confounding uh, in reference to potentially mask use in a real world setting as opposed to a lab setting because you're really looking for, you know, uh, you know even though we're, we know by now SARS-CoV-2 is aerosolized. But if we're going by airborne, uh, and you think about humidity, uh, it supposedly would be a better carrier, for example, some to like saliva and so on and so forth of an airborne virus. But you don't take into account pollen. And so now if pollen plays a larger role than humidity, now you have to start looking at the aspect of how basically the virus is either traveling i.e. or the pollen is weakening the individual, so on and so forth. Again, just food for thought. All right, and after that, food for thought, it's fear for thought. Again, the links will be there so you can cover it to the article yourself, but still, it's interesting that the researchers actually looked at that, and I really, really, really respect that. Fear of COVID-19. Now, this is an interesting aspect of this because people don't recognize the fact that a lot of the pandemic mitigation strategies are really revolving around fear. And when you read this article, they're going to recommend, for example, to pull back on the fear. And they call it fear arousal or fear induction. And for example, if you see this little picture here, uh, it's determined, it's designed for social engineering. Whether you like it or not, there's obviously, we you know, it's behavioral modification and manipulation, and it's hurting some people far greater than it should, especially individuals who are socially isolated. So even though this may appear like a social engineering article, what they're really basically trying to say is, hey, pull back. Fear induction alone will not solve a crisis since fear-related behaviors may also contribute to harmful actions during viral pandemics. So this is more of a message to government and policymakers you know, that, you know, regardless of the reason they're attempting to scare an individual, it's really not doing a service past a certain point. And, you know, we see that often with uh, other pandemic mitigation strategies, so on and so forth. But again, I'm not going to interpret the data per se. I'm just going to respect the researchers and not add publisher bias to the research. And I'll have the links there for you. All right, next, talking about fear, vulnerable newborns. This was probably one of the most disturbing articles that I have read in a long time. And again, it goes down to fear and fear overkill. And this is what you're going to find disturbing now. Vulnerable newborns being separated from mothers in COVID-19 pandemic. Now, we're thinking that's a horrible thing. Uh, most of us. But a large portion of healthcare workers, two-thirds of the healthcare workers... One thousand two thirds of one thousand one hundred twenty healthcare workers surveyed worldwide would separate mothers and babies with a positive or unknown COVID nineteen status, and this is what they're trying to imply. And this is a real important aspect because what we've done is we weaponized uncertainty, knowingly or unknowingly. And they really bring a good balance to this. Now, if you're a policymaker, you have to make a decision. What do you do? And we're going to get to that in a second. Implementing kangaroo mother care and keep mothers and babies together could save more than 125,000 newborns, newborn lives, representing a 65% decreased risk of newborn death compared to risk of newborn deaths from COVID-19. Now, again, every life is vital. But you are a policymaker, and you have to come to these tough decisions. And this is what they're trying to state. 
is new research underscores the need for decision makers and providers, particularly in LMICs, to protect and strengthen care for small and sick-born newborns during the pandemic. And what they're talking about is mother-to-infant contact, how vital it is involving early prolonged skin-to-skin contact for preterm babies and exclusively breastfeeding mothers having a positive or unknown COVID test status instead of these newborns to being separated from mothers and are increased risk of death because of fear. So what we're doing is we have weapon we have weaponized uncertainty. We know we have a lot of knowns. If you have pandemic mitigation uh, factors, social isolation, distancing, we know you will shut down schools. We know you will harm people economically. We know they'll result in uh, worsening health outcomes in the future, especially with the closing of gyms, so on and so forth. We know that. But what we've done is we've taken the known to the damage because we have a little bit of uncertainty and we basically, we fear the unknown much more than we do fear the known. That's another aspect of uh, fear induction and fear arousal. Now, here we go. The importance of this finding is reinforced by new research published in eClinical Medicine conducted by Global Capital Collaboration led by the World Health Organization, da, 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 as the estimate if universal coverage of kangaroo mother care, baby to mother contact, was achieved, more than 125,000 newborn lives will be saved. Conversely, the risk of newborns catching COVID and dying would result in fewer than 2,000 deaths. Together, this shows at least a 65-fold increase in the risk of dying by not doing kangaroo mother care. Kangaroo mother care is one of the most cost-effective ways to protect small and sick newborns. Now it is more critical than ever to ensure that mothers are supported to do kangaroo mother care and the healthcare professionals feel safe and comfortable support in that delivery. Our data should use promise for many lives saved with universal KMC. So it is vital that we use this opportunity to strengthen care now and build back better after the pandemic. Newborns, the most vulnerable citizens worldwide, each year two and a half million newborns die within 28 days of their birthday. And more than 80% of these are low birth weight. So you go on and you get the idea. Basically, you have to decide. Do you risk the lives of 2,000 newborns as an uncertain outcome? Or basically, do you sacrifice those 2,000 for 125,000? Again, I'm not going to have publisher bias. You're the policy maker. You're the decision maker. 125,000 or 2,000. All right, you know, that's the gambit. Next. An interesting confounding factor. Vulnerable countries experience lower COVID-19 infection death rates than the norm. Now, keep in mind, they're talking about vulnerable countries being financially or not as developed. And they could play a role, for example, in conflating factors, for example, like um, transportation, industry, you know, more concentrated population, city, and so on and so forth, because you have, you know, less feudalistic type uh, outlanders. So basically, or outliers, I should say. So basically, you're looking at that aspect. But bottom line is this. More economically developed countries, for example, showed higher infection rates in mortality than basically lower uh, uh, established or advanced, or I should say, human development index countries. And now let's go into the research itself. So as it says... Results from our intensive ecological modeling analysis indicate that countries that were generally more vulnerable, again, not as developed, were less likely to be affected by COVID-19, whether in terms of infant incidence, as infection rates, so on and so forth, or fatality. This finding was rather unanticipated. In theory, at least according to the Fund for Peace, more fragile and more vulnerable countries are more likely to be affected by any infection disease, vice versa. So what happened was, it gave a totally inconsistent finding. They would think that basically countries that were not as developed should be more vulnerable to infection, where it actually been the being the opposite. Countries that weren't as developed were actually the least vulnerable. Now, again, that could be due to public transportation systems, transportation systems, infrastructure, so on and so forth, greater concentration of population in certain cities. But again, you know, for example, let's say you look at uh, – India and the Ganges River, and or basically certain areas where the sanitation may not as be as uh, implemented. India is very advanced, but however, though, if you're looking at it from that aspect, you know, 
certain places like that where sanitation may not be as much of a priority, yet the infection rates are so much lower. In India, for example, used to use it as, as a, an example, they're coming through the COVID pandemic uh, pretty much uh, very, very well, much, much, much better than a lot of, again, are more ecologically, or I should say, aware or technically um, equal to India countries per se. So let's go, for example, let's go to the next aspect. So again, the links will be there for the research we look at, but however though, you would think third world country, more susceptible to infection because you're looking at malaria, typhoid, diphtheria, and so on and so forth. But at least in this particular case with COVID, it is not the case. Next, mouthwashes. I really recommend you read the research on this as well because you're going to find out certain concentrations uh, were used for different uh, mouthwashes per se. But I want you to think, but first let's go to the research itself. Certain mouthwashes might stop COVID-19 virus transmission. The study published in the Journal of Pathogens found that Listerine, I'm not running an ad for anything. I'm just going to read the research as follows. I do not like brand names, but regardless, it's something that we really want to bring to a conclusion. The study published in the Journal of Pathogens found that Listerine in the prescription mouthwash chlorhexidine disrupted the virus within seconds after being diluted to concentrations that would mimic actual use. So that's the main thing, mimic actual use. Further studies are needed to be tested for real-life efficacy in humans. The study was conducted in a lab using concentrations of mouthwash and uh, uh, would take to contact tissues, replicate conditions found in the mouth. The study found two of the mouthwashes showed promise of potentially providing some protection and preventing viral transmission. Betadine, betadine which contains uh, povidine, pov povidone, iodine, and peroxol, which contains hydrogen peroxide. However, only Listerine and chlorhexidine disrupted the virus with little impact on skin cells inside the mouth that provide a protective barrier against the virus. Let's go into the research itself. All right, in conclusion, all mouth rinses tested, inactivated replication, competent SARS-CoV-2 viruses, and pseudotype viruses expressed in spike proteins. The cytotoxic effects of mouth rinses should be considered when accessing their antiviral activities. Since diluted Listerine and CHG exhibited no cytotoxic effects, these products may be good candidates to reduce virus spread. Now, what do they mean? Now, think of it this way. If a person, for example, has used mouthwash early in the morning or they use a mouthwash or gargling with it a couple of times a day. Now, considering the fact how COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2 may transfer uh, per se as vectors, People wear face masks for what reasons? So saliva and airborne saliva per se don't come in contact with each other. But if a person's doing mouthwash and the main aspect of a mask is not to infect another individual, can a mouthwash be a solid proxy for those that cannot wear a face mask? Intriguing question per se overall. That's if even the face masks make a difference. Of course, you know, my consideration is the fact that SARS-CoV-2 is aerosolized below five microns. You wear a mask. It's going to lower the uh, airflow below 15 milliliters a liter, leading to more nasal deposition. Therefore, basically, people that wear a mask may increase infection and not decrease infection. But we covered this a million and one times, and the media has not covered it once. But outside of that, if a mouthwash can deactivate uh, the virus to the point where it's not infectious. Could it be a good vaccine? Again, that is for us to decide later on, per se. And also, too, I want to go back to my site real fast here because there's a couple of articles which I think got passed by. Uh, let's do this one real fast. Let's go here. All right. Now, I didn't get a chance to cover all of these. Progesterone, for example, uh, may improve outcomes in uh, men as far as COVID-19. Uh, walking helps as well, too. Let me just go real fast. Da, 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 da. I wanted to look at this. Oh, these are important. Here we go. Another possible aspect of deactivating uh, COVID-19 is ultrasound. Now, the interesting part about the ultrasound 
is the preliminary uh, – these results are preliminary based upon limited data regarding the virus physical properties. Nevertheless, researchers say the findings of the first hint of possible ultrasound-based treatment for coronavirus, including the novel SARS-CoV-2. How exactly ultrasound could be administered and how effective it would be in damaging the virus without complexity of the human body are among major questions scientists have to tackle. But the coronavirus structure is all too familiar, da da da. Uh, what they found out, they found that the ultrasound, the, the vibrations between 25 and 100 megahertz triggered the virus shell and spikes to collapse and start to rupture within a fraction of a second. Now, can you imagine that? Let's say, for example, you're walking into a public area or wherever, and thus provided this ultrasound that this vibration doesn't uh, damage, you know, human tissue. Can you imagine literally going into basically just walking into a restaurant, and they have this like this ultrasound machine that you just walk past by, and it deactivates the virus? These are the innovations which I find totally amazing, which I'd love to see us head in the direction of. And of course, from UV lights, UVC 254, you know, UVC I think was 232, uh, we, we've covered a million and one pandemic mitigation strategies, which are non-invasive to the individual, which do not restrict uh, freedoms or their inalienable rights. Uh, but no one's picked them up. Instead, we stick with this medieval uh, distance mask, you know, fear. Bottom line, and to me, it's it's a major uh, major travesty. But Another one just to play it safe. Let's go on and go this one real fast. Do do do. All right, and here we go. Do do do. Aspirin use may decrease. I'm not an aspirin fan, but again, if it works, it works. Bottom line, That's, I don't want to incorporate my bias. Uh, I'm not, let's say I'm not a daily aspirin use fan. Uh, but here it goes. After adjusting for demographics and comorbidities, aspirin use was associated with a decreased risk of mental. Mechanical ventilation, a 44% reduction. ICU admission, 43% uh, reduction. And hospital mortality, 47% reduction. Think about that. That is just an astounding effect. Now, we covered earlier another aspirin article in reference to this too. Again, you know, it's low cost, easily accessible for millions right off the bat. Simple, basic, add it to the vitamin D, the selenium, magnesium, vitamin C, everything else like that along the line. It's uh, only taking, for example, if an individual were talking low death. Now, it's not going to be like the Spanish flu. Remember the Spanish flu? Uh, they were prescribing up to 8 grams to 30 grams per day of aspirin uh, back then. And you're wondering why people were drowning in their own lung fluid. Who knows how many people actually died from the aspirin as opposed to the Spanish flu, the treatment per se. But that's pretty amazing. Let me make sure real fast too. I'll look at the other information. Dun, 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 dun. And I think we're okay. To do vulnerable countries, study progesterone, pick up the pace. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah, the rest we're not going to cover real fast. All right, let us begin with the data research as follows. Here we go. We saw that. So let's start with this one right off the bat so you can understand exactly what's happened. So we're looking at actually the, the states, which are the media pundits and the, um, the so-called medical professionals, which have been wrong a lot, uh, were basically making it look like the apocalypse was going to set in because these states were uh, loosening their restrictions. The data doesn't support it. I mean, they could be educated at Harvard, Yale, Stanford, every place else like that. Wonderful credentials, and I highly respect them, but data is data. And the data doesn't support their, their hypothesis, and they're wrong continuously, meaning they're incorporating personal biases in making people's lives miserable when they don't have to be. So let us proceed as follows. All right, merging data frames, data frames. Again, most of the information we're pulling from now is the CDC. A little bit from healthdata.gov, but most of it's from the CDC. And they're still not being great with it. Proceeding, da da da, data frame, data frame, data frame, data frame, data frame, data frame, do do do. All right, hospitalized patients with COVID to totaled inpatient beds. I think last time I had a percentage by accident. Here we are. Remember that we first started out 
It was all about, you know, we were a lot of unknowns in the beginning, which were perfectly fine. So a lot of bad mitigation strategy, things just to play it safe. Then it was two weeks to flatten the curve. And then there was like no curve. Then it was, they, they kept on going. They kept on changing, moving the bar all around. Well, this can happen, that can happen. Then the hospital will be coming full supposedly. And yeah, we know how that goes. So here we are. This is your graphs uh, between inpatient beds and total inpatient beds being used by COVID. Do 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 do. Nothing exciting to show because, it, thank goodness and gratefully so, um, very very uneventful. So let's scroll down. Do 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 do. New deaths per hundred thousand to no mask or loose restriction states. And uh, here we are. Now our y-axis are going to be different for each for each area. So keep that in mind. So. What I'm looking for basically is we have different geographic patterns, population densities, climate, so on and so forth, but really focus more so on the pattern. Then no matter what they do or what they say or what they implement in so far and so forth, really doesn't seem to change these patterns that much. And again, the patterns are going to be a little different for each state. It could be testing and so on and so forth. But overall, you're going to see about the same pattern. So if we do it like if we you probably could even normalize it if you look for if you talk statistical terms, if you run simulations like a few thousand times. And so here we go. Boom, 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 boom. You can find like a, you, you, you could, I mean, it's like clockwork. Now, Florida, maybe not so much, but still, you see sort of a pattern. And again, these are our loose restriction states, and these are important to remember as we head into the rest of the data. I mean, not the state itself, but as far as what it's representing. And here we go. New deaths per 100,000 on tight restriction states. New Jersey's kind of weird. and But however, though, overall, Connecticut, interesting. Now that I'm, in, I'm looking at this because I'm looking at the geography is what I'm thinking. Uh, as opposed to whatever this is, boom, boom, boom. And, but overall, pretty close. See, that's weird. See, look at this. Uh, it's different. Now keep in mind with different different y axes. All right, and here is our our basically our area. If your state is now a loose restriction state, it's not covered. Let me know, and I'll throw it in there. Now again, we're looking at tight right here, so the blue, and then now we're going up a hundred thousand, so we can compare apples to apples, not totals like I see in the media done often. It you can't get a subjective thing if you, you have a population of 10 million compared to a population of 10. You know, it just doesn't make, you, you'll see that when we look at South Dakota, North Dakota, bounces, the lines bounce all over the place. And so there's that. And then here's our states comparatively too. And I think uh, yellow is LSS, which stands for loose. Do do loose as in loose restrictions. Yeah, I know what you're thinking. Total mortality, all right, there's our totals. All right, now here we go. New cases per 100,000, uh, smooth. But this is really, this not smooth. it's a rolling seven-day average. So there's our, our tight restriction states. Good luck trying to find the colors. We're only looking at patterns. And it's interesting too because you notice, again, it's a very, it's like a machine learning module, very, very machine learning module, very similar patterns. And here's our dates down below. And our loose restriction states. You see how it's weird? And again, you know for me from the very beginning, my biggest problem was when these restrictions started coming into play, we had no controls in which to compare. Now we kind of are having controls where we can compare and realizing it's not making a statistically significant difference. And there's some disturbing information as we come forward. Ready? Here we go. All right, look at this. This is our information, new cases. Uh, overall, from the beginning of May to uh, hopefully before May ends, so you just tell the it's it's power is just too good to give up. Once you got it, it's like wow, you know. As long as they can keep on keeping your fear of the unknown, it's like flying planes. Unfortunately, I hate to say, it, will crash in the future, no doubt about it. But you can weaponize that uncertainty and play on that paranoia. But you know. But life has to move forward, and life is risk. All right, and just like that article we had on on mothers, it's like how can you do that? There's that, and then green green states. I mean, the kangaroo mothering care. I mean, literally, 
tearing a newborn away from mother even with an uncertain COVID-19 diagnosis? And you, you can actually rationalize that and, and feel good about that? I don't know if they're okay with that, I should say. Well, I, you know, that I have a real major problem with. All right, green loose states versus red tight states. And uh, there's that we should opened up with right there. Yes, it is true. The loose states are actually having less cases per 100,000 than basically the tight states, which are represented in white. Again, there could be tons of different factors involved. You know, I heard before, well, there was bad weather, people couldn't get tested, so on and so forth. Again, we're talking different geographies across the country, so that's, that's, that's a tough uh, hypothesis to hold. All right, here we are. These are just new cases total. All right, this, we're looking deaths per 100,000, smooth. Well, actually, I should say rolling seven. And there we are. Look at the pattern. And so basically we're looking at it. I want to make sure. All right, we have loose states are green. And yeah, look right there. You could see it. In January, February, you could probably say that's true. But let's look all the way over here. What do you think that is? Nursing homes? Long-term care facilities? Yeah. You know what I mean by certain states calling Michigan, New York, and California out? Why is this here? And this is here. You know, obviously there's some issues going on. Now here and here, yeah, you could probably say, hey, the states with low, loose restrictions, you know, look what you've done here. You've had, instead of uh, 0.15 deaths per 100,000, you had point. Oh, sorry, 0 0.015 deaths per 100,000. You had 0 0.025 deaths per 100,000. All right, that you can be faulted for. But here, that's intriguing. And then here, patterns. The patterns follow. Do type pandemic mitigation strategies make a difference? Does the data support it? Not in a real world setting. All right, green loose states versus red tight states. Deaths per 100,000 rolling. Seven, we're just looking at up from March 1st to uh, March 19th, even though I just turned March 21st. And that is just by pure coincidence. So again, it comes down to a trade-off. Even though what you see here may show some benefit, schools being shut down, people in long-term care facilities being isolated, uh, people missing cancer diagnosis, treatment, high blood pressure, diabetes, so on and so forth. A social welfare programs, you know, you know, from school lunch programs, which are a major source of nutrition for a lot of kids, it, it there's a trade-off. So yeah, you can have that benefit from point, let's say, oh one one five to point oh oh eight seven deaths per hundred thousand, but at what expense? A sixty-five times fold uh, death rate in newborns, for example, as we covered earlier. Your call. You're the policymaker. And if we just scroll down here, da, da, da. this is just an example of how a lot of people are trying to um, make the mistake in reference to smoothing the charts, where you have to actually create a different column. But that's for our data analysts. Do 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 do. New deaths per hundred thousand smooth. Again, tight restriction states, loose restriction states. Look at the pattern. 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 I mean, again, well, we're looking not just to point out a pattern here. We're looking at the fact to say, are what they doing making any difference policy-wise? Your call, not mine. I'm just showing the stuff. All right, new cases per 100,000, tight restrictions from April 2020. And here we go. Just going down the list here. I mean, we covered this last week. So let's prefer expediency. Uh, new case per 100,000, no mask, loose restriction states. Obviously, the chart's a little bigger because I'm as many. And nothing really weird uh, showing here. And uh, nothing really weird. And let's keep on going. New cases, burned 1,000, no mask, loose state, states, uh, states from January 2021. There we are. These are our loose restriction states. Again, remember different y axis, so we're really just looking at the patterns. All right, there we are. North Dakota seems to be flattening out. And so on and so forth. Now our tight restriction states. 
a little bit of bounce up, bounce up. You know, I heard, I heard on the, you know, the TV, uh, whatever that is anymore. Yeah, oh, how it, another wave is coming in certain states and so on and so forth. They're seeing more cases and upticks. Again, our data is from the CDC, but I have no freaking clue where they're getting their data. But again, it's just the same. Let's go into the COVID world data audit. Do, do, do. All right, you see right here, you do have a little bit of a global up uptake in new cases. And now the data we're using here are sources we're going to be using our world and data, which I've always enjoyed. Our mortality percentages of positive cases are back to decline. We're pretty low. Now look at this mortality percentage. We're pretty low. Again, this people are terrified, justifiably so. But however, the behaviors didn't adapt to the new scenarios and they're still hanging on to uncertainty. Again, let's go back to do, 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 do new case smooth. We saw that mortality percentage. We saw that. I don't know why I keep on doing that. Great Britain lockdown. Now here's an interesting thing here, Sweden. Now this is the cases. Now the reason it's interesting is this. Sweden started implementing mask mandates and the weird, the weird part about it is remember all the way up to here, uh, they really had no masks at all. In fact, probably right up to here, they had no masks. And so you, Sweden has an interesting aspect as far as being a, not a control, but if you look at studies about washout periods, when, you know, for example, one time they take, you know, caffeine for energy, then they don't do anything for two weeks and then they take a placebo for energy. And so what ends up happening is you can count Sweden as being that washout period. So when they started implementing the masks, the cases began to go up. Death rates, mortality began to go down. But we're going to get into that in a second. All right, you see right here? Boom, 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 boom. And so here we are. Here's our new cases per million United States. We're about da, 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 right about there as far as pretty close to below July when I thought the pandemic was going to be over. Then we started taste, testing younger populations. All right, case deposit rate. Boom, boom, boom. USA, cases move per million, doo, doo, doo. and then new deaths per million. Now keep in mind, here is Sweden. Now look at Sweden. It's actually, I mean, UK is dropping pretty fast, and we're going back from March 6th. So it's a pretty narrow window, but you can see. United States, even though it looks pretty bad here, United States has come down quite a bit uh, over the past few, uh, few weeks. Our Asian friends and... Man, they, they were not even in the game. Not even in the game. Good luck trying to sell them a vaccine. All right, Sweden, uh, do deaths per million. Uh, look right here. 1.64 uh, to 3.69. Uh, 369 And even though they went to a mask level of two, which means in certain areas it's advisable to wear a mask, it's not like a three or four like the United States is or in certain areas. It's, it's like you can't even jog without a mask. Uh, they, their death rates began to go up, but never were anywhere comparable to the United States. And it's actually going down pretty far. And so there they are compared to the United States. And people, you know, Fauci, Locke, and Sweden go, oh, look, it's a Scandinavian country. What difference does it make? And it does make a difference. That is data. COVID, you know, that's just the way it works. And it's, it's not out to make you happy. Yeah, you could be happy if the data turns out the way you'd like it to be. But obviously, the data is not representing what they're saying. And as I said, again, I have no clue where they're getting their data. Uh, new deaths, Sweden, new deaths, USA. We see that. Now, remember, here's the United States versus all of Asia. I mean, it, isn't that weird? Look at this. You see that trend right there? Now, that's ex almost the exact same trend we we're looking at a little while ago for tight states uh, in reference to um, deaths overall. So keep that in mind as opposed to loose states. But look at Asia. Seriously. That's that's incredible. Uh, again, Armenia, closest running in second to the United States as far as um, deaths per million. And now here's our data per se. Uh, let's go into it. Here's India. Remember I talked about that? And the United States. India is a, is a technologically advanced country and largest democracy in the world. And again, certain areas like the Ganji and things like that, we're thinking whatever it comes down to be. Um, India began to play part of the game known to a mass level of four so they actually had some stringency involved but it's a huge country and they're still doing pretty darn good comparatively 
Let's keep it going. All right, here's our num numbers. Asia population, 4,463,000,000. Uh, they've had 414,730 deaths overall out of 4,463,000,000. United States has 541,143 unfortunate souls lost out of 329 million. The Asian ratio went from one death mortality for every 10,761 individuals. The United States is at one mortality, unfortunate soul, out of every 607. And the population ratio, as you already know. And Asia's, again, they've just done a wonderful job. And again, when we think, you know, pandemic mitigation strategies, we're automatically, you know, defaulting to either China or Japan or Taiwan. And, you, you know, we're thinking the mask and this, but it could be a million and one different things. And, but however, though, not all these countries in the Asian province practice those sanitation measures as well as Japan, China, and Taiwan or Hong Kong or Singapore. Yet, these are the numbers. And it's the way it stands out. Controls. Controls are very important. And I don't know why we're not utilizing controls in determining our policy decisions. Obviously, we've restricted every single inalienable right we possibly have. We've got a total fear, and more so, we've probably created a tremendous amount of collateral damage. We know people who work with social services and social welfare. Um, to what end? But again, I digress. The world uh, vaccine started coming out right here. Remember right there? Doo -doo -doo. And ironically, again, the correlation, that could be. I mean, I saw a correlation with the testing sites. Remember, they put everyone in these massive uh, COVID testing sites to these drive throughs and things like that. And, but they did But then the, they thought that, you know, they didn't think that COVID was, or sars cov 2 was aerosolized. They knew it was airborne. They didn't think it was at three microns or below five microns so the mask would not make a bit of difference in the world. But again, we adapt our behaviors. There we go. Do, do, do. There's our correlation. Set it down. You know, nice T maps. Let's keep on going. Keep on going. Uh, there's our new cases per million to mortality percentage, uh, vaccine to mortality percentage right there. So basically we're looking at red being mortality. See how it's dropping? Uh, people fully vaccinated per 100, 100 1.2 we're at. Correlations, bad, bad, bad. Theoretical quantiles, something may be there. Uh, da -da -da, new deaths to cases per million world. And again, red is deaths, and then purple is your cases. It tends, obviously, you would find a strong correlation with that. Here we are with the rest of the world. Da, da, da. South America. I know people are talking about Europe in the fourth wave in Europe. Pff, no. Uh, South America is my primary concern. This is, this is where the world focus should be and right now more than anything else because of that change. But I don't know why it's not. Instead, we're looking at Europe. Like, what the heck? Here's North America, comparatively to the rest of the world. Going down. Uh, Asia, new cases, smooth. A little bit up. Doo -doo -doo. But, however, though, uh, Africa. Look at that. Boom. Um, still no data correction on Spain. But there's your new cases, smooth. Oh, it's the fourth wave. Third wave. Or whatever wave it is. S silly. Uh, new cases smooth, North America, going down. New cases smooth, Oceania. You can see a little bit up there, but again, you're talking like, huh? Like, they're like hardly anybody. New cases smooth, South America. That's my that's my one my one interesting aspect, is why South America? If you're going to play off of any figures, do that. And then we look at the rest. Do, 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 do. All right, new cases overall. Again, this is the scary, all have their own Y-axis. There's your new case in Europe. Third wave. All right. Yeah, there's a little bit of uptick. Yeah, I'll give you that. Uh, North America. Doo -doo -doo. Oceana. Again, very low population base. I don't like to see what the standard deviation of that is. South America. Now we throw them on the shared y-axis, meaning they're all sharing the North American y-axis right here. Doo -doo -doo. South America, see the rise? But how it compares it is still more than North America. And it is a rise, and they're sharing the y-axis here. But still, it's like, it's a, wow, North America, for whatever reason, got ravaged. Again, going back to the data, 
on economically advanced countries tend to have more infections and mortality. New deaths. All right, here we are. We're showing different y-axis here. And there's South America at 2,000. United States bouncing about to 1,300. And then we share the y-axis. South America, the only one I want to look at. That's just kind of weird. And there's that, new cases per million, shared y-axis. Doesn't mean anything's making a comeback. I mean, something's happening in South America, either getting more effective with testing, whatever it comes out to be, but something's on, on it's unusual with that. Europe, South America, da da da, North America's going down to Oceania. Because it'd be like really weird if North America like goes down to like nothing, South America's still there. New deaths per million, all right, here we are. Europe, not really any change. I would like to see it lower though. Asia, not a game they play. Africa, man, just way down. Oceania, See how it's different when you share the same y-axis? Uh, we're looking at North America here. Is that a different one? Yeah, they're all 35. Uh, so just to give you an idea. And there we are as far as me messing around, new cases moving. I was trying to find the new wave, uh, as Fauci and them would say. Now, I shouldn't blame Fauci, but whoever. But again, he's the one's the vocal mouthpiece for that, so I'll keep on bringing him into it because he has, he could do this just as, I mean, I'm sure he could look at data just as well as anybody else can. I'm just like an amateur. Literally, I am just an amateur. And so many people could do this so much better than me. But again, where are the Elon Musks or the Jeff Bezos or the Mark Zuckerbergs? Oh, they may say they care, but reality, my gosh, I do this in my spare time for them. They spent like a one one hundredth of their income on proper data analytics in reference to helping solve the pandemic. It could be. They could do it in a heartbeat. But they don't. So put your money where your mouth is. All right, here we go. Investigating correlations. Here's the world. Shrinzy index. Ba -ba -bum, ba -ba -ba -bum. Remember, we're looking for here a different color because each time it's different. We're looking for a yellow or brown. And yes, stringency index is correlated with stringency index. All right, so there's that. And But how are though? Do, do, do. No, 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 no. Not with anything. Purple. Purple. Purple fully vaccinated per 100. Here we go. Do, do, do. Looking for a yellow or brown. No, no, no. Or no, no, no. actually, I should take it the other way because we're, we're trying to prevent disease. Um, no negative 0.7s or 0.8s. Nothing. Again, it's not to knock the pandemic mitigation strategy. In the beginning, I can understand it. But man, if you're not having the data to support it, all you're doing is creating corrosive societal damage. Stop it. I mean, seriously, this makes no sense. All right, a 70-year-old or 0.72 is a correlation with, once again, female smokers. I always, again, we always point that out. I think it's going to be our, our test case for heat maps. Here we go. Da -da -da, life expectancy. We ran through all this once again. Da -da -da, made no difference, no difference, no difference, no difference. United States, remember when we first started this? was at 3.6. Well, guess what the United States now went to? 3.691. So it's pretty close to the last time we thought the pandemic was over. So again, depending on who decide to test next, we'll see. You know, if you start testing your pets next and start getting more positive coronavirus tests, that's that's going to be really demoralizing. All right, world masks. Remember, eventually they're going to try to incorporate your pets into this. Again, when things ebb and flow, people become addicted to it and everything else starts getting involved. All right, here it goes. Zimbabwe, the 15th of May. This should be an up-to-date thing. This is face masks. Um, our world and data changed their, their data frame things to day instead of date, so it must be up in the beginning. Uh, no, nothing. Facial coverings are correlated with facial coverings. That's about it. Um, what's this? Oh, I see patients per million. Uh, correlate with new cases per million. All right, I could I can go with that. All right. Again, United States it says level four, and we both know that's the case because lots of places that don't. Here are Sweden level two. We saw that way up here. They make it like it's going to go to level three. Hong Kong and places like that. They're not they're not mandatory. They're twos required in some specific shared public spaces. Uh, and now we only have Vanuatu. Vanuatu. Is the only place that basically does not require facial coverings, has no policy. Sweden used to be here. Look at Russia. Russia is at a two, and compared to the United States, which is a four. 
And so we'll see it, but not really a four. You know, obviously. Here we go. United States, deaths per million. And if I'm speaking kind of fast, please forgive me. But I'm trying to get this done really, really fast. Uh, cases per million, da-da-da, pretty low. This is all data you never get to see. That's why I'm doing it. Sweden, deaths per million. Even though the mass level to one, two, two. It's like they raise the mass level and the case per million went up. I'm so glad the mortality level is going down. Look at this curve. Even though the mortality rate is so much less than the United States, it follows a fairly similar pattern. And obviously with more tests per thousand, you have more cases per million. Surprise, surprise. Columbia, oh, Columbia, da, 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 Japan, never played the game, never played. They don't not play and they're testing like crazy, but uh, nothing's happening. Thank you. Japan's doing a great job. New Zealand, yep, and there it is. You have deaths per million on the x-axis, all right? So, yeah, da-da-da, da-da-da, no Shiana, nothing's happening. Finland, remember they had a little bit of a rise there? It's interesting. The more they test, the more cases they have, all right? India, many people don't realize how well India is doing. There it is, right there, boom, boom, boom. Testing like crazy, cases per million, just not happening. All right, there it is, Spain. Yeah, there's that third wave in Europe thrill. Uh, France, oh, we have to lock down Paris. Da -da -da, da -da 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 -da. You know, they just mess with people's heads, right? United Kingdom, again, remember them? They were falling apart and the people just had it. Look at that tests per thousand and look at the cases per million. Pretty impressive. Italy, oh, they just locked, I don't know what they're locking down. All right, here you have a little case per million, deaths per million. I would still be a little concerned, but, you know, I'd only really be isolated vulnerable populations and maybe incorporate vitamin D. Because remember in Lombardy, Italy, same thing. Most people were back then, in the very beginning, they correlated vitamin D deficiency with susceptibility to COVID-19. Has anything been done yet? No. Because, again, I have no clue why. All right, there we are. And uh, there's test per thousand because I think they're just they're deficient mentally. Uh, the leadership. Because it makes no sense. They should have been recommending that right off the bat as far as vitamin D to individuals in the hospital. I mean, you're talking a 1,000 IUs per seven days? Come on. You know, seriously, at least during the white plague here in the United States with tuberculosis, we had sanatoriums, which most of our horror movies now seem to be based on. COVID states, here we go. Ba -ba -bum. I'm going to scroll down real fast. da 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 all right, remember the spikes? Boom, 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 boom. Spikes, because Montana, who's this spiky here? All right, here we go. Da, da, da. Lower the population, the greater the variation, it seems like. Mortality increase is nothing. Let's go straight down. Boom, boom, boom. Yes, yeah, spiky. Uh, still spiky, still spiky. Hospitals per 100,000. All right, look at that. And there's Iowa. Remember that Iowa's going to fall apart. Remember that? Wrong, wrong every single time, but we keep on listening to them. Still hospitalizations per 100,000 seem to follow with the course. No matter what's done or what is not done, it's the same thing. Uh, California mask, no mask. Do, 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 do. Please forgive me if I'm speeding through here. And then we are going to go to hospital occupancy. Here we are. California, again. Now we're like some sort of red tier, like these color-coded thing. Remember back to, the, you know, just it's like, yeah. All right, New York. I'm referring back to color codes when Donald Rumsfeld did it back after September 11th. Recall that. That went over real well. But how are now we do color codes and it's okay. In New York, there's that. Florida, there's that. Again, just presenting you the data. Iowa, North Dakota, these are the states which basically had one time had a mass uh, consideration or some sort of social isolation thing and said not to. And no, the world has not come to an end. All right, and then we are going to go to our vaccination delivery. Do, do, do. Real fast. And there we are, completed vaccine administration versus the population. That's if vaccine delivery was perfect. There should be our percentages right there. And here we go. Do, 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 sound effects. There's a hospital, the vaccine comparison. Right up there about. And I keep in mind. Uh, we're actually pretty low on the ICUs. If vaccine delivery was perfect, this would be the percentage of people vaccinated. Now, obviously, we're hearing things about vaccines being left out and trash, not delivered properly. But if delivery was perfect first and second, that's where it'd be. And then 
that we'll call it a night on that. Uh, we'll cover anything else a little bit later on. So what did we cover? We covered this. Supplements that may protect. Pleading with people to get at least 1,000 IUs weekly of vitamin D, which should not be a plea. It should be a given. You know, if you can control what you put over people's mouths, they should be able to control what people put in their mouths. And how about a little bit of vitamin D? Or, you know what? Just open the freaking drapes and get them some sun. All right, here's that. And then COVID-19. An interesting correlation between pollen, which I'm surprised the media outlets did not pick up because that, you know, high pollen concentration could lead to the weaker immune system, so on and so forth, which could lead to greater susceptibility to COVID-19 risk, which may mean a development in face masks, if they're going to be effective, they're going to have to filter pollen. All right, and so fear, yeah, that's, we got it, plenty of that. And they're telling politicians to back off, do a better job, just stop scaring people to death because you want them to do things your way. Uh, newborns, obviously this is the most tragic article of them all. I cannot believe people separating newborns from the mothers, even with an unknown COVID-19 status. Vulnerable countries, yes, they have less infection and less mortality rate. A lot of different correlations, they can go on that. Uh, and then mouthwashes, go to the study, read the different concentrations and aspirin recover it. And then also too, we looked at ultrasound, wherever that went, uh, ultrasound can knock it out as well too, but I'll have all the links for you. And then of course our databases are collapsing when data should be getting better. That is getting more difficult to, how would you say harvest. Again, we're after channel signing off once again. Thank you very much for watching. It is 56 minutes. I got to end it now. I don't want it to go 60. Catch you all at a run. Thank you. Gratitude. Look forward to seeing you all either next week or Tuesday if you want to do the regular shows. Catch you all in a bit. See you then. Bye.